Hello, everyone. Welcome to this evidence-based mental health uh, Google Hangout today. Digital mental health. How does it work? And how? Hello, do everyone. Welcome to, to this evidence-based mental health. That won't work if I'm talking to myself. Uh, I'm Michael Ostacher. I'm uh, I'm the uh, digital content editor for evidence-based mental health, and I'd like to uh, uh, welcome you. I'm in Stanford. California at Stanford University School of Medicine. Um, uh, we're joined today by a number of terrific authors and experts uh, who will help us uh, discuss this today. We'll be discussing two papers. Uh, the first is uh, Proportionate Methods for Evaluating a Simple Digital Mental Health Tool, um, and also uh, Effective, Engaging, Secure, Applying the Oracle 24 framework to evaluate apps for chronic insomnia disorder. Uh, we're joined today uh, by Lisa Marzano. She's the uh, she's an associate professor of tech of psychology and the faculty of science and technology at Middlesex University, and is the digital mental health editor for evidence based uh, mental health. We're also joined by Bethan. Davies, who's a research fellow at NIHR Montech Healthcare Technology Cooperative, We're joined by her colleagues, Jen Martin, who's the program manager of Montech, where her work focuses on evaluation and implementation of digital technology for mental health. Jen has a particular interest in national policy around funding of digital technology as a member of NHS, NHS England's. Expert Reference Group for Digital Innovation and Adoption. Mike Craven is Senior Research Fellow at NIHR MindTech uh, Technology Cooperative also, and his current research is on the design and evaluation of digital health and medical devices. We're also joined by Simon Lee, who's the author of the first author of the paper, is Principal Consultant and Senior Health Economist at LifeCode, uh, a health economics consultancy, and his interest in research is in methods for M health assessment and outcomes measurement. We're very lucky to have him join us. We're also joined by um, Riper, who's at uh, Voodoo University, University in Amsterdam. Um, uh, her her list of 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 titles uh, goes on and on, uh, but she's the triple uh, the chair of Triple E for MGO E Health Excellence in Amsterdam. Uh, in the Netherlands, and is the past president for past president of the International Society for Research on Internet Intervention. So, uh, uh, Lisa, we have a special edition uh, on digital mental health, and I, it would be nice if you would introduce uh, our viewers uh, and people who are listening in uh, to this. I also want to remind people that if you'd like to join us live uh, through Twitter. Use the EBMH chat. Hashtag EBMH chat, and you'll be able to join us. Andre Tompkins is not able to join us today, joining us uh, virtually. So, Lisa, can you tell us a little bit about the issue and what's important about it? Absolutely. I have to say, I hope you can hear me okay because the line's quite distracted at my end, so I can hear most of what you say, but not all of it. But hopefully, you can say, I'll, I'll keep going yeah. if you can. Um, just to say hello everybody and how great it is to, to have such a fantastic panel today. Just to give a bit of context about this, I guess this hangout, this is the first of two hangouts we're going to have before the end of the year that focuses on digital mental health. And, and that's because we put together a, um, a special issue um, focusing on, on digital mental health for EBMH. Uh, as of last year, EBMH has a digital mental health section. And because we thought it was such an interesting area, and we, we had so much interest in it, and, um, that we thought it might be actually for the first time for the journal to put together a special issue. So I was one of the guest editors together with Chris Hollis from um, NIHR MindTech, Jim Malley from Sydney, and although not officially a guest editor, actually we had a lot of input as well um, from Andre Tomley from the Mental Health, and of course a lot of support from Andrea Cipriani, who's the uh, editor-in-chief at EBMH. Um, and I've got to say, I think the digital mental health, the, the mental health, digital mental health, sorry, uh, special issue um, went really well. I mean, yeah, hopefully 
it's possible to sort of put a link online now to the to the issue um, as it's out. Um, it didn't just end up being a special issue on digital mental health, but a bumper issue. We ended up with sort of more papers than we than we thought. Um, and I think together, what they do is sort of showcase, uh, in many ways, how exciting this, this sort of new field is. Um, some of the potential of new technologies uh, in relation to mental health research, but also mental health practice. And, and in relation to um, specific groups, for example, there's, there's a paper in the special issue that's particularly about um, digital technologies for people with learning difficulties, um, different contexts, different therapeutic applications, uh, and also different countries. There's one contribution, for example, that focuses on uh, um, cross-cultural um, using sort of digital platforms. Um, and I think sort of together, so they, they kind of I guess showcase some of the some of the exciting potential of this area, but also some of the challenges and some of the uh, unresolved issues, some of the questions that haven't been addressed, perhaps. And I think today is a great the papers that are being discussed today is a great example of that because um, I guess what we'll be discussing over the next hour is is whether these technologies only. Okay. Well, Lisa, finally, you are breaking up a little bit. So, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I think it probably. Yeah. Would be to... A bit about the first paper. Yeah, Lisa, I think it would be helpful for you to probably mute at this point, um, since I can hear you. But, Bethan. In the midst of all our technological difficulties, yeah, <laughs> uh, I hear you just fine. Why don't you start uh, to tell us a bit about about your your paper and what it means, and we can use that to jump off into a discussion. Yeah. Okay. So our paper was about using a proportionate method for evaluating an, an app that was available called, that still is available, sorry, called In Hand, um, which was developed by in, with young people, and it's a, just a di simple digital app that they can bring up on their phone just to uh, monitor how their mood is right now and to check in with that. It was relatively straightforward, not very complex. And as part of a, I think it was a comic relief funding, um, they, they provided, provided funding to have an evaluation of it. I think they came to us once it had already been made and was live. So actually the evaluation process wasn't too much involved during the, the planning stages of it. Um, and yes, our paper um, was about going into um, what sort of methods would be needed for such a digital tool because it was felt that an, uh, a randomized control trial would be too big, too, too, much, too complex for a relatively digital tool and would be very expensive as well. Um, so it has to be proportionate both as well to the, the funds you've got available. Um, and in terms of the, the, what we saw as proportionate, we went um, three different ways of collecting sort of, um, of data around that. So first we had um, we had some access over a period of six months to sort of the analytical data, um, where how often people used it, um, and how that, it, that went over time. Um, secondly, we had a, a very simple user survey. Um, so there was an update to the app and it would come up with a, a pop-up within the app inviting them to participate um, in a prize survey about and to ask them to give their views on the app. Um, and then thirdly, if those who had completed the survey could also opt in to participate in an interview where they could provide more detailed information about their experiences of using in hand. Um, and yeah, felt that that method uh, that methodology was a lot more appropriate and proportionate to the to the app being evaluated and sort of the the goals of the app as well. Um, yeah, Mike and Jennifer, yeah. have you got anything else to say on that? <laughs> no, I think that's a, a great description because, um, as Beth and said, we we were we were taken on to do this evaluation, but actually there was quite a, 
a really small amount of money and time allocated to it. And so we had to really cut our cloth accordingly, as in what can we, say, what, what can we find out that's helpful, both to the developers of this product in terms of them demonstrating that people like it and people use it and people feel like they get some benefit out of it and that's why they use it. But then also information for perhaps um, healthcare professionals who might want to recommend this as just a simple app. And we felt that we struck the balance quite nicely in this in coming up with a method that uses so much of the data that developers are capturing anyway with their analytics and then supplemented with something relatively simple in terms of some extra information. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> I enter Michael. So yes, I'm back. Oh, you're uh, back. I had the same problem, but I'm back again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just take these things, whether my computer equipment works completely. But so, so tell us a little, to go back, Bethan and, and, and your colleagues. So tell us exactly the, you know, so what was the tool intended to do? Uh, that you were developing. So, and what was the so what was the, the experience of it from the, the from the user or patient perspective? What was the, what was its hope? Uh, I think it's important for us to have a sort of a little bit of a background about that. And let, us, let us understand how to how to uh, do that. And Mike, it may be helpful for you to mute. I think. You know. So, uh, Inhand was developed by a, was a, an arts uh, organisation who were working with young people who had experience of um, mental health problems um, and their goal was to sort of, um, they wanted to have young people to have a tool that they could use to bring focus to the current moment um, and just to sort of check in with how they're feeling. So. Um, as soon as you open the app, you're sort of presented with a screen that just says, hello, how are you feeling? With four different options that these young people came up with that they thought would be most relevant based on their own experiences. Um, so the four options were good, so, so, not good and awful. Um, and so if you press sort of the good or so, so option, it said, you know, keep on going. Uh, you know, that's good, or would give a little inspirational quote that these young people um, came up with. Um, sort of, if you're not, not good, it sort of encourages you to try and uh, focus on trying to do something that would help you improve your mood. Um, and then if it was um, awful, it would encourage you to sort of note it down, a bit like a diary, note down how you're feeling. Um, and yes, I think to my knowledge, I don't know if Mike and Jen can comment any more about sort of the, the um, co-design process of the app. Yeah, I think what was quite interesting was the fact that young people themselves came up with the brief of the product. So that's how this funding scheme was set up, was that there was a big panel of young people who came up with ideas for digital tools. And then charities and developers then applied to get the job of building the solution to that. And it was very much focused at the well-being side of things, rather than people who had particular clinical conditions. So it wasn't aimed at depression, it wasn't aimed at anxiety. It was very much about, you know, well-being, you know, how are you feeling, sort of focusing on that every day, just giving people something in their hands, hence the name, when they needed it, on the bus, at school. So a very, very simple, very, you know, very... Very simple. Yeah, right. but people... Well, that people really liked it and they kept going back to it yeah and so and so how are you going to, and so tell us a bit about sort of what your evaluation showed and and mike do you want to chip in there i'll have to unmute i think hmm? mike oh you want to mute? yeah <laughs> mike's muted for some reason yeah um, We're yes, a slave to our technology. Yes, I, I, guess the, I, guess, I guess the components of the evaluation was, in terms of the analytics, it was do people use it and how do they use it? So how, how many new users are there every period of time? Those users, are they using it regularly? Are they going back to it? And, and at what 
day and what parts of the app are they using. And what was quite interesting is that we um, worked with the developers um, when they were using their analytics, because they were saying to, th saying to us things like, we've got X amount of thousands of people um, using the app every week or whatever. And then when we saw the analytics, it looked like there were lots of people who were just going onto the app for very, very small amounts of time. And what we said to them was, how, um, you know, people who go on for a couple of seconds, they're, they're clearly not getting anything meaningful from the app. So you really need to think about what, what, it, what you can class as a meaningful interaction with the app. And so they actually then took another look at it and said, okay, well, we would want somebody to, to say how they're feeling today and then go to another page and maybe look at some photos or look at some quotes. Um, so that, that's a meaningful interaction. Essentially interacting with the screen that happened after they responded to how they were feeling the screen yeah. came up. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and, and then we were able to then say how many meaningful interactions and, you know, that there were a good number of people who were using it a number of times a week and a month. And then we and then we looked at the kind of what, why are people using it, and that was the that was the questionnaire and the survey and the interviews. And what what we did was that we looked at a um, commonly used mental well-being scale. I think it's the Warwick and Edinburgh scale. And again, we worked with the developers and said, what what have the young people told you about why they want to use in hand and why did you develop in hand? And then we looked at which of the par uh, parameters of the Warwick Edinburgh scale. Um, equated to that. Um, so in a sense we had a bit we had a hypothesis which was that we felt that um, you know that the developers had a hypothesis which was that using in hand would make them able to um, feel relaxed, think clearly, um, have a positive outlook and those sorts of things um, and then we evaluated whether or not it indeed was associated with those and what was really interesting was that there was there was a, there was a positive relationship with the parameters which the developer said were important within the Warwick and Edinburgh scale, and the ones that they felt that in hand didn't address, um, we, we found that we agreed. Our results showed that that was right, that young people didn't feel it was helpful with that. So, um, so that was really nice with us. And then the interviews then just supplemented that and, and gave us a bit more depth around why people felt it was helpful. So did your, did your interviews sort of uh, confirm what you were getting from your survey results? They did. They did sort. They did mostly expand on sort of the items that are on this adapted Warwick Edinburgh scale that we used, um, and sort of just clarified. Clarified. So the survey will have told us, say that um, what was it? Uh, nearly four, uh, thirty percent said they were more able to take control in in the survey. But then in the interviews, that said it just provided a bit more depth on to how it helped them take a bit more control. Um, so we've got some example quotes in our paper about, you know, it helps them lead on, lead on to thinking about more other things going on in their life. And again, that provides a sense of control um, to them. Um, so I don't think we got as many interviews as we hoped, but we got, we got sort of enough. <laughs> and what was, what was also interesting was that in hand was very much aimed at young people. So between the ages of 16 and 25, but it was, um, we found that um, there were, and it's, not, to be, it's, it's to be expected, there were plenty of other people who were using in hand. So although it was aimed at young people, there were plenty of older adults using it as well. There were people all across the world using it. So even though it was set up in the UK, and very much aimed and marketed in the UK, there were people in New Zealand, I think, using it, in the States, in Canada. Um, so it was kind of nice that although it was, um, it was quite a simple, cheap app, People, it, people were continuing to use it and they were feeling like it was making a small but meaningful contribution to their mental well-being. Yeah. Helene, do you, would you care to comment a bit about this? Or Mike, you have something to say. Yeah. Oh, Mike first? Yeah. Is he online? No, no. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, Helene, right. yeah, it's fine. Mike, go ahead. So you've, been, the, you've been muting you, so. Talking over you, sorry. But um, yeah, I think one of the answers it was very ecological in terms you know, we were catching people using it naturalistically. So it was bringing you know, a number of people into a lab and having right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, nobody was being prompted to use it. Right. Hell yeah. Well, the analytics give you quite a crude but quite a large sample in that case of the 
Yeah. I mean, uh, but then also we can add we add into it in layers. Yeah, Mike. Unfortunately, I think there's a lot of feedback when you join, so it's a little bit difficult to hear. Helene, you were gonna. Uh, I'd ask you to comment. Yes, um, I have. Please, um, please first in. of all, I um, really like the paper, so my compliments. Me, my I have a couple of uh, nice work, and I know how difficult it is to engage young people uh, as well. I have actually two more que uh, two questions or observations. Uh, first, about this uh, this defining this meaningful action. Um, I think you can do that in different ways, but if you listen to marketeers of those apps, uh, yeah. they say the most important issue is to open the app. So even if they are all only, say, two or three seconds uh, uh, engaged right. with your app, it might be much more meaningful than you think, because maybe those two or three seconds can be of support uh, for uh, whatever action they were undertaken, so it would be nice to elaborate on that. Uh, and I also am curious how you define the, the purpose of your app, because is it a kind of, say, over-the-counter digital self-help small tool, uh, uh, which everyone can use for whatever purpose, like self-help books uh, in, in the stores. People buy them when they have love pain or they buy them when they want uh, to get better on with their neighbors. So the, the quality of the self-help books and the theoretical principles on which they are based, they might differ a lot. And still many people say, okay, it has helped me. Or do you want to have more a theoretical uh, uh, and empirical driven mental well-being app and if that's the case i i, I think uh, you have done great pre-work but now it would be necessary to assess uh, maybe not clinical effectiveness but mental well-being uh, effectiveness maybe in some well controlled or maybe studies or making use of data big data analysis that you can apply more innovative methods to exactly say to see it's not only Sufficient to say what users say the app is doing for them, right. although very important. So, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I think it's it was clear that I think this was very much in the kind of public health sphere of of, of, of interventions. And I mean, what was interesting is the the fund that set up that funded the development of Enhance. It was a charity in the UK called Coming Relief, which. Um, decided that mental health and well-being of young people was a, a big issue and they wanted to develop some digital tools. And I think, I think the project started in 2012 or even 2011. So it was a long time ago and it was one of the first, I think one of the first digital tools that was aimed at this space. So, um, I mean, looking back on it now, I think they did a, a really great job. They funded seven projects and In Hand was one of them. Doc Reddy was, uh, was another. Um, and then there were a few others that weren't as successful. I think um, what they really, they started with this, um, just talking to young people. So it wasn't theoretically driven. It was driven by what do young people of this age group, between 16 and 25, with some experience of um, mental health difficulties, what, could, what, what sort of support do they want from digital tools? And then they just created a brief to try and address that. And then it was only afterwards that they thought, well, let's try and do some evaluation of it. And that's when we came in and tried to do something that was light touch. But hopefully, like you say, build it, building that evidence base. And I, I don't think they want to develop this any further. I think they're quite happy with it. People still use it. People still like it. But I think it can tell us something about the role of these simple tools but they're not interventions. They are, in my view, is they're in the public health space. They're free. They're free. People can download them if they like them. They can use them if they don't. That's fine. But I, 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 I may I chair? Yes, Go please. On. Yeah. Okay. I part. Okay. I, I, I agree with you, but maybe not completely because I think even if we have public health interventions and they are free in in the domain, uh, and when they are used for soliciting ideas and, and, and wishes and needs assessment, but it depends on who is going to provide it as an intervention, whether there is a need for more evidence uh, 
based proof, so to say. So I don't know who is offering, who is offering or recommending the intervention. For me, it's still an intervention, although it's a yeah. light right, right. one. Well, I think, I think uh, Helene, you're, you're really speaking to something that I think is important, sort of this interface between well-being or these apps that are available to the general public mm -hmm. and what we would consider to be treatment for people that we would recommend from a perspective of a professional, from a, a physician, psychologist, other therapist. Um, can you talk a little bit about that interface and what, what, what your thoughts are about that? Other people are free to join in too, please. Yeah. I mean, if, I, if I'm actually able, um, in our conclusion, we said, you know, we didn't preclude uh, more um, detailed and controlled studies following this. Home that it is being used. Yeah, I Mike. I think it would be yeah. Mike. I think it would be helpful if you if you uh, shut your video off and just were on audio. You do that. And I also take. Yeah. Speak again. It, yeah. Maybe he can st uh, start up uh, a new uh, contact. So yeah. log out and log in again. Yeah. No. Or I think it probably his bandwidth is being okay. Taken up. So. Um, I think if we if we can text Mike to uh, shut off his video and leave his audio on. Yeah, I think um, I think so Mike I about, about this whole space is because um, we get so many mental health practitioners, whether or not they're GPs or psychologists or counsellors, yeah. um, asking us about what products they can recommend to their patients, free things, things that they don't have to pay for. And I guess the question is always going to be then about what, what bar in terms of evidence and safety will those sorts of people need in order to recommend things? Um, because if they want a, a huge uh, clinical trial, that's never going to be possible. You know, it would be crazy to run a, you know, spend £100,000 evaluating something that's freely available and costs £10,000, £15,000 to develop. Um, so, so what is the what is the bar? Right. Well, I think even 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 more importantly is uh, to how are we going to know as professionals whether we recommend that people use a given treatment? Right. So we're we're referring people to the treatment, or we're Im implementing them ourselves in our offices, and the and the, and I think the you know, thinking from a, a clinician perspective, uh, how do we know which of these apps are going to provide the kind of help we want uh, for our for our patients? Celine, you were going to say something. I think. Yeah, yeah, I I, I agree. It's it, it, if people download such an app uh, on their own, maybe through marketing. Yeah. I find that something different than when you, as a clinician or a GP refer to a certain app uh, you you need to know it's not doing uh, harm and you need to know that it's uh, how you say well developed and and uh, and and the privacy of the of the people using uh, the app and what's happening with their data i really think that should be established and i also don't think uh, that it's a good uh, if you really have developed the public health app at low cost and uh, free of charge for so many people, maybe even on a global scale, I think it would be very worthwhile to conduct a, a clinical trial or a step wedge trial, or I, I don't know what design exactly. I, I think because if it has such a huge public health impact, the health gain on a large scale can also be very high, but then you need to have a number of, how you say, quality criteria, defined and i think the person of the other paper the group who wrote yeah. about privacy and this yeah, this whole true. framework I, I think that might be even be a first step yeah. uh, to apply so yeah ex exactly it's per it's a perfect transition too because yeah. uh, i i was going to suggest the same thing simon it's, it probably makes sense for you to, to talk about your paper because it really addresses this issue so please yeah. present it to let us know, and we can uh, go on with the discussion about it Sure. Um, I think it's kind of it's on the lines of what you said. We were looking 
in our study at apps for chronic insomnia disorder we picked this therapeutic area mainly to be honest because of its size at the start we did this research on a very limited budget and we wanted to uh, we wanted to get this underway you know we didn't receive any funding externally so we wanted to see if had been developed over a number of years by essentially a lot of um, experts, whether they're information governance experts, health economists, primary and secondary care providers. We kind of did focus groups and got opinions of what people wanted from health apps, what was necessary and what was desirable. It wasn't as explicit as a discrete choice experiment kind of way of doing it, but it was a Delphi panel and focus group. And we developed this very simple very simple tool for assessing apps which we were hoping that the lay person could understand so it's not along the lines of the nhs apps library beta questions which are quite daunting for a for a patient to look at when you're asking really in-depth questions about iso standards and whatnot we wanted something that was really basic and really translatable and understandable for the lay person downloading an app not just for clinicians so we went away and we, we developed our um, our scale and after much to and fro back and forth we picked three areas based on other criteria like the Mars criteria and other thing like that and the gaps in the literature from those and we thought that user experience you know how an app feels and how it how it feels in your hand how user friendly it is and finally clinical effectiveness and we figured as a good starting point that some of those three attributes could probably well define an app we went to the um, Android store for this and we started looking for all apps that have the term insomnia or sleep in their description. We pulled out, I think it was about 300 apps and our criteria for this was really simple again. We were only interested in any apps that made an active claim that this app could improve your symptoms of insomnia and that it had a therapeutic benefit relief so we immediately excluded all apps from this it's worth pointing out that simply provided an mp3 soundtrack <laughs> if you're looking at things like kind of you know potentially just a background music because that you know it's just you know we're not going to real music here so we got rid of this uh -huh. we knew this was not going to be of interest yeah. so um we were looking for things that provided information, advice, cognitive behavioural therapy in a number of instances. And we wanted to get a really broad kind of spectrum look at what was on offer. And the questions that we developed, and I've got them here, they're really quite simple. And they're, they're, a lot of them are taken from basic European data principles. So if I start with data governance, we were asking, you know, does the app state that no data will be shared without, with other parties without explicit user consent? And that's the first principle of the Data Protection Act. We wanted to make sure that the app outlined a process for managing any data confidentiality breaches should the data get into the wrong hands. Was there a privacy policy within the app or on a website so that users could be informed and see what they were signing up to? Because the side effects of health apps and not just the clinical side effects that may be apparent. Let's say if you use a diabetes and um, blood glucose and blood insulin adjustment app and the clinical side effects of getting that wrong, but it's quite a big side effect in terms of your personal data going missing. That's that's something that's it's unanticipated, but it can be quite a big deal. So we also wanted to know whether the data privacy policy provided any details about what is collected or and probably one of the most important ones is making sure that the app only collected data that was absolutely necessary for the app to function. So that they weren't just collecting data about you willy-nilly that could then potentially be sold on or used in perverse ways. These eight questions to start off with. We looked at clinical assurance and this was, this was a lot simpler. So very simply, we were asking, you know, is there a statement within the app about user feedback during design development or testing? So we wanted to know that the active user base had been using this app and their thoughts about it. Involvement in testing. Was there a stat that has been shown? Was there a statistic that shows that it's been beneficial to someone with a relevant condition? So really simple things. A clinical trial or observational study or any form of evidence that we can have a look at and assess the quality of. And is there any statement about how frequently any advice or guidance will be reviewed to ensure that it's clinically relevant? If we're looking at um, an app from 10 years ago, it's likely that the guidelines have changed since then. So we wanted to make sure that this was up to date and they weren't dormant and they weren't recommending things that we've later found out to be non-beneficial. Things like whether a relevant expert were involved, was it backed by a university or another neutral accreditation board? Really, user experience. 
will the app help people who have visual or hearing impairment? We wanted to promote accessibility here, not just apps for those who are, you know, fortunate enough to be, you know, fully capable of using the apps. We wanted to, you know, reach out like the W3C standards suggest to help. Um, is there a help section for children? This is mainly for children, but it comes up to it later. You know, can you find out what's going on in the app? Does it use clinical terms that, that aren't explained? You know, we don't want that. And is there a way of reporting any errors? And can you set goals for yourself? And we took all of these standards, all 24 of them, and all we did is we went through one by one in quite a boring and laborious way, and we assessed all of these apps. We downloaded them all. In the case of Sleepio, we, we paid for Sleepio. We, we kind of we went through being here who's a team of kind of university educated graduates they're not they're not um medical scientists they're just users of apps as are you and i and they went through and they used the app for a short period of time and filled in this questionnaire so all of these questions were on a very simple evidence-based yes or no basis so it wasn't like the kind of like a scale where you can kind of go yeah it kind of did this and yeah i think this did this and i and you know we might get different results this was very simple. Does it have it? Doesn't it have it? Objective evidence. And we went through and did it that way. And what we found was quite interesting. So we found that just over half of the apps had a privacy policy, which was roughly in line with what we were expecting from other data that we've seen published around the world. But over a third stated that no user data would be shared without explicit consent and that's quite a worry because there's been quite a, a lot of um, literature recently about how useless a privacy policy can be if it doesn't state the right thing so often a privacy policy is seen as a great thing but if you don't read the privacy policy you don't know what you're signing up for so i think the bbc published a fascinating article recently in norway they took the 30 most used apps in norway by the norwegian people and they did a live stream of reading the privacy policies and at the same time they had someone reading the old testament and the privacy policies took longer to read than the old testament <laughs> which just goes to show you not everyone's going to do this and put this donkey work in the legwork but right so it's important that you don't just assume that a privacy policy is a good thing because it could just be a way of legalizing you taking someone's data to use it willy nilly. Yeah, exactly. mm -hmm. So we, you know, we, we looked at that and when it comes to effectiveness, what we found, which is what you'd expect, I guess, was that the apps that were grounded in a basis of cognitive behavioral therapy tended to outperform those grounded in hypnosis or meditation and mindfulness and, and this is a statistically significant finding we only use one way anover for this we had really small numbers we probably could have used a, a skull wallace but this was quite an interesting finding but it might be what you'd expect because cognitive behavioral therapy has a much greater basis behind it for evidence mm -hmm. Interesting findings, these did not reach statistical significance purely because of the small numbers, was that the number of downloads of an app, which if we were all honest, I bet at some point we've all used as a proxy for which app to download, you know, it's kind of greatness in numbers. We found that the number of downloads of an app was not correlated to its objectively assessed quality in terms of data privacy and clinical efficacy, but it was linked to user experience to um with user experience, so what you found is that apps that were had a lot of downloads tended to have better user experience scores. They were nicer to use. They were, but you found that their data privacy and clinical efficacy scores went down, which suggests a trade-off from developers as to what they're focusing on there. And then when we looked at the user review scores that you get on Android, you know, 4.5, 4.3, we found that the apps with the highest user review scores tended to have the best. Um, user experience again, whereas clinical efficacy and you know and data privacy, which are both very important, tended to go the opposite way. But again, this wasn't statistically significant, so we can't we can't draw a conclusion here. And it's going to take more research to find out in other therapeutic areas whether this is in fact the case. But with this was to use this tool to see if we could blindly, in essence find good apps and we were fortunate in this therapeutic area unlike most therapeutic areas that the NHS has a gold standard or an, an NHS approved app and that's you know Sleepio have put a lot of effort in over the last few years to in RCTs they put a lot of research in and they're they're producing a lot of results and as a result the NHS approved this and recommend it on NHS choices so Sleepio did in this process with how the other apps combined as a pooled effect did and what we found was that as you'd expect it's nothing surprising 
Sleepio absolutely dominated all of the other apps across all domains. Its clinical efficacy was far superior. Its data privacy approach was far superior. Its user experience was about the same, but that's because user experience was very high in this group. So what we found is that going forward was that well, perhaps in other therapeutic areas where we, we don't have the benefit of an NHS accredited app without the benefit of clinicians going, please use this app, are using this tool in a preliminary sense, Eisen scanner to say, well, we've done it in sleep. We've picked out that this one's the best app. You know, one of the reviewers came back and said, well, it's no surprise that you've picked, or someone came back and said, it's no surprise that you've picked out Sleepio because it's the best app. And we said, yes, but you know that Sleepio is the best app. Not everybody does. So, you know, you have to have a clinical background or you need to have knowledge of the literature to do that. And that's what we were hoping that this tool, which is very simple to use, could do just to provide some element of security alongside other much more rigorous processes like the NHS kind of beta questions, but which unfortunately take a lot more time to, to get on the way. You know, you, you're taking much more time with a thorough NHS review than we're doing one of these every, you know, every two hours. So, and we're just gradually trying to build up. So we just wanted to provide this evidence to people to say, if you're going to download a health app, you know, have a look at these basic criteria. And that's that was purely what we were, we were hoping to, to show because we you know we don't want people just using apps willy-nilly and getting the really bad ones i mean in in mental health we've seen the review by karolinska about the suicide prevention apps that recommend risky behaviors and kind of you really don't <laughs> Lord. you really don't want that no. so especially if you're making the effort to download such an app so again we weren't trying to do anything fancy anything that was kind of academically superior we just want to do something really basic to say here are some really simple signs of effectiveness let's apply them to these apps and see what we get and you know no as and that was that was basically what we what we did so we were quite happy with the results yeah well i think that it's really what you bring up is really interesting and i'd, I'd like to open this to discussion because you talk about a uh, a dilemma i think that we all face which is the the, the difference between sort of effectiveness and whether or not there's quality right so how how attractive a, a, an app will be to people and sort of the it seems the, that a, a challenge for us from the professional side is to try to bridge that 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 gap try to, to to deal with that that issue because if people are just going to be willy-nilly downloading things they should at least be directed somehow to download the things that are most likely to help them but they're going to do the things that they think are the most fun or the most engaging or the most popular. Or, you know. Engagement you have, wise. You, yeah, go ahead, Simon. Yeah, I think actual engagement wise implementation, it's a hard thing to, um, it's a hard thing to, to police to kind of, to push this forward. And I think you're right about the, the evidence, you know, we can never replace uh, clinical effectiveness as a, as a, as a brilliant tool. But, you know, as, as, as Bethan said earlier, you know, most app developers aren't fortunate enough to have the funds to go in, to go and do a big trial or even an observational study. And a lot of the time they're not wanting to hold on to data, which you're then going to have to pay a higher insurance premium for, you know, if you're holding data that's potentially useful. So I think it's about striking a balance where when you're in equipoise, between two apps that are perhaps lacking a clinical study, what other indicators have you got there that can help move you towards a better outcome? So I think the last thing we want is we don't want people to be using apps, trying them, trying apps that don't work, and then they completely get turned off yeah, apps because cool. they've tried a few of them. Because what I think what we're seeing is that standards tend to be getting better over time. Getting better, there are better processes involved now. There are better apps. There's things like you know the um, how iOS with their Parkinson's app. They've done the biggest clinical study ever using using the, you know the iOS. I can't remember the exact title of it, but we're getting more and more resources for research all the time, and things are getting better. So I think the worst thing would be to completely turn people off apps at an early stage when I think we're just starting to pick up some speed and a lot of the potential of them. 
Uh, Helene, you were going to... Thank yeah, you. yeah. First of all, also to you, my compliments. And I really uh, like the simplicity of... Uh, it's not simple, but as you said, it's a kind of stepped... Uh, not stepped care, but stepped diagnosis or stepped evaluation uh, process. And I think it can be of use not only to app developers, but also, for example, like us, collaborating with app uh, developers to do a kind of self-assessment uh, uh, based on your framework and then i also like the idea that when say they they pass through a number of tests uh, within your framework then maybe you could uh, conduct a more in-depth uh, uh, test and i think what what would be good if say you have now developed that uh, that framework is that maybe you take it one step further and that a group of mental health uh, researchers or web-based uh, re um, e mental health resources that we endorse maybe your framework or another framework as well because it gi really gives you some uh, hand in tool uh, so to say and i am currently myself at the moment of uh, doing some research with 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 some apps and i think i could now use it to evaluate it being not an expert on all this kind of how you say uh, legal um, legislations which you need to fulfill to provide uh, an app which is also which will pass the medical ethical committees when doing research so that's uh, i really like it so i hope you take it uh, one step forward i just had one um uh, uh i say question in your paper you say uh actually web developers should conduct uh, maybe clinical trials or other type uh, of studies themselves but they don't do it because often they lack money specifically when it's commercially uh, uh driven that's um how you say attention we all uh, realize uh, but I am actually thinking um and that we see with the researchers or the clinical researchers who would develop their own websites or their own apps when they do clinical trials they get better results than when uh, their study is replicated by groups of researchers who have not been involved in the development uh, of a specific intervention or app so i think we should follow a dual pathway yes uh, maybe initiate the first studies but then also try to replicate uh, the results we have obtained by other uh, research groups. Uh, I think maybe the English, native English speakers, uh, there is an English concept for that, alleged I, You know, when the developers are too much hooked on their own product and they do the research themselves. Alliance, how do you? Allegiance. Allegiance, Allegiance. yes. <laughs> and some studies will, I think, have recently be published or will be published that show that actually show this effect of uh, that so the researchers who assess their own intervention leads to better results so maybe we have yeah. overestimated uh, the clinical impact of our own interventions uh, but i i simon i really really uh, like what you have done so i would like to hear and maybe the other thoughts about what it will be the next step with your framework are you going to promote it as a maybe in a proposition paper or do you invite the community to assess uh, how you say their apps with your framework do you go to submit yeah. it to the eu for example because i know there have been many endeavors to come up with a with a framework for evaluating mobile apps from within the European community and for one reason or the other yeah. that failed. I don't know why, but so what are your future plans? Uh, um, so at the moment, we're not tied down to any one strategy. As you said, with the EU, we've, we've been approached and we're currently working with the EU Commission on working, you know, working across Europe to, to help kind of, um, to help, it's actually to help GPs and to help kind of you know, service providers to identify to identify apps so that they can kind of safely provide to their. Uh, I suppose completely free at the moment. Anyone can go onto the Orca website and start looking at apps. It's not a paid for service. It's com completely free in that aspect. Again, using the service, we would look to kind of with people to assess 
their apps. So mm. we, we, we kind of, we do a lot of um, helping app developers to point out to them very early on before they release, by the way, your data privacy policy isn't up to scratch, you know, little things like that. But I mean, things that we're really trying to do, and it's really quite difficult, and I'm sure you'll all have kind of views on this, is we're trying to encourage app developers who have heard of this Orca process to provide additional data on things like, like Beth had mentioned before, things like stickiness, collect this data of how often people use an app and then reuse the app. I think I, think I highlighted a stat in my, my paper, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it was, it was quite low that said the number of people who go back to using an app mm -hmm. after they've used it the first time and it drops off, you know, kind of asymptotically, it drops, it drops really quickly and it's kind of, you know, we're looking for other ways of improving this tool because we know it's not perfect and, you know, we know that there are other experts who know ways of measuring quality and obviously this differs by country as well different countries are looking for different things so and we're always looking for ways to improve this i guess to add in other measures of quality but for us one of the main things is working with app developers themselves so that we can you know we can find out these other softer metrics perhaps which is still really important but tend not to make their way into evaluations that much but obviously with in hand it, it did and that's a, that's a good thing but um you know it's these is these little things we just want to provide a holistic approach to looking at apps i guess that kind of you know can be quite objective and we're open to everything i i, I guess you our website and we've got a few more papers lined up with this because one of the big issues that we've got with our scale honestly at the moment is that we rate all questions equally, equally we give them a yeah, uniform, yeah, yeah. uniform weighting so i'm a health economist so that was kind of my choice i had to take the flack for that the reason this is done is really simple is because there's no objective scientific way at the moment of us saying okay than this now we're planning kind of discrete choice experiments with clinicians and with patients so that down the line we can say objectively that clinicians would trade off so much of this for this and they value this more than this and then eventually we can weight our kind of tools so that it's more reflective of real world practice and obviously then we can kind of get a more value-based assessment but at the moment we do just apply a uniform approach in this research tool but as a limitation as such it's more just unfortunate given current research research resources i guess and we're still in an early stage so are you yeah. talking about life code or orca no orca sorry yeah, yeah. this is orca yeah. yeah 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 so i wear i wear a few hats no no i understand no I, no I understand beth and you have something that you wanted to comment on you just have to unmute yeah i i just with um uh, Simon's comment um, just now about you know all items being equal weighted that was something that came to my mind as well when reading the paper and yeah it just seemed me and Jen were talking earlier about it it just seems that it with 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 under applying this criteria it would be just so useful if you had a a group that was completely multidisciplinary so you've got your psychologists there your people who work in tech there your ergonomists or, or whatever there to all work together in sort of um, uh, go, like going through an app. That would be like a dream world, <laughs> obviously. Um, but yeah, I thought, yeah, no, um, yeah, just, yeah, with that comment about all items being equal weighted, I think was the, the one that came into my mind as well when reading it. But no, I really, yeah. good paper. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things that's important is that the, the, that uh, people are developing apps because they have a, a view of what would be useful or, or important, but then sort of way to even think about what the outside world thinks is important. <laughs> you know, and it seems like what you're doing at Orca is quite important in terms of sort of establishing standards for what uh, what you think apps should do and how to and and how to judge them so that the people who are actually developing them have a framework that they can follow as they as they develop forward and it seems like the the, the interaction should be sort of uh, uh iterative right so the people who are developing the apps are focused on user engagement and whether or not their app gets opened up and what the wh whether or not people find it helpful and on your side you're looking at sort of quality and other and privacy and other issues any thoughts about that 
Yeah, I mean, you, you, you're spot on. The, the, the iterative kind of um, side of things is the way this was originally. Um, that, that is what we do. We do, you know, we do work with developers. You want to make sure from the outset that apps are as good as they possibly can be. There's no point, you know, because it costs money to developers, obviously, to keep changing things and pulling from the outside. And every time you re-upload, let's say, to iOS, there's a delay. There's a, a cost. So we're trying to, kind of, we're fully mindful of the uh, the economic pressures on on developers. You know, as uh, you know, as with everyone, researchers. So we're we're fully aware of this, and we I guess we're just hoping that enough use of this tool so that we can um we can start really getting to the nitty-gritty of apps it's, it's worth me just pointing out here by the way that this research process the orca 24 and um, for research reasons because i knew no one would want to read this it's one quarter of the questions that are asked in the full release we actually asked 96 but there's no way no, that evidence-based mental health we're going to let me publish a table with 96 <laughs> questions and the, the results to every one of them it, it would not have happened the paper would have been it would have been kind of encyclopedia like but yeah, it, well. so there's a lot of things like you say that, that that matter to different people and i think it's making sure that you capture enough of those and over time value them appropriately so that you can get a more a more transparent picture so that everyone can know exactly what an app does and does not do what risks it has and doesn't have before they download it i think it's just it's i, I liken it much to the um to the patient information leaflet in a pharmaceutical product or anything you buy over the counter it tells you what side effects you're likely to experience which ones are let you're less likely to experience and for me using kind of technologies like this i think there's a really important point here that just because you've evaluated something once doesn't mean it never needs evaluating again. Much like you need phase four studies and pharmacovigilance in, in pharmaceuticals. It's important that once you've evaluated an app, you evaluate it again, just in case things have changed, on like privacy policies unwillingly, so that people are kept informed and so that, you know, you're still promoting the right the right tools the right people you don't want to be unknowingly saying this app's amazing and secretly steals all your data and it, it offers you 10 year old advice so i think that's an important thing making sure that there are there are assessments that are so kind of finite and small that they're scalable right. over and over again without it taking weeks and weeks and months and months because you know the, yeah. That's what, that's what we're doing. So, yeah. yeah. Helene, can you? Yeah, I, I just, because uh, the weekend is coming up. Yeah, exactly. have, if, <laughs> no, it's not that I want to leave the question, but I ask Simon to uh, free float your thoughts because it appears if you read your uh, paper and the evaluation that the more, say, evidence based an app is, the less it's used. What is the attractiveness of yeah. those less evidence-based interventions? Is that the design? I, I mean, is that the way they phrase uh, the yeah. issues? What I, I know you don't know it, but but give it yeah. a thought. So, I wish I, w I, w I really wish I did know. It. I wish our sample size was a little larger than the nineteen we included, so that we could uh, evaluate this statistically. But um, I think. Off the bat, so my hypothesis with this is that apps have got better over time, such that those with the most downloads realistically were probably developed the longest ago. Okay. That's my hypothesis behind this. So that the better apps now, you need some way of picking them out, directing people to them so that they can then pick up attraction. But again, I'm not sure because I don't know, I'm not an app developer myself but i can imagine kind of just as a user of i like nice things as anyone if something feels good and looks good to um to keep using it and i think there's a, an important piece of research here with with patients with users of apps mm. to, to, to look at well, what do they actually value and i think like things like discrete choice experiments or other kind of scales yeah. would be really useful for, for both the nhs and for the people yeah. the going forward so that we know I, I I think it's something more, more. I think it's something more sort of uh, uh, simple. I think that the people who know what they're doing from a clinical perspective are just not as interesting. I think. <laughs> I mean, I think that the people, you know, in other words, that the people yeah. that really do interesting apps are young, energetic people with mm -hmm. great ideas that haven't that haven't gone to graduate school in psychology or for their training in in psychiatry. I mean, I think that those are, and I think that they're better at sort of. The, that piece of things, and I think once you start doing this work, you it, you get bogged down in like the 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 details of whether the evidence is effective. I mean, to finish up, I just wanted to ask a quick question. 
uh, an overarching question about this. So, so in, cl in interventions in general, we generally do clinical trials, right? But a lot of what people said here is suggest that understand a randomized trial is not going to be necessarily the 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 future for how to determine whether these apps happen. Um, uh, Helene, before you go, but do you have a quick comment about about that? I mean, are we going to need to do randomized clinical trials in the traditional way that we've always done them, or is this something that we're going to be able to do in the way the way Simon and uh, Bethan are discussing, where like you do, you really don't have time to do that, you don't have the money to do it? Uh, are you just going to collect data in a you know sort of big data and sort of determine whether or not things are effective? What do you think the future? Holds? Yeah, well, it, uh, I. I think we should apply a multi multiple method uh, approach and i but i i think the f i think you started uh, the session with we should do we we need to be sure we do no harm and it depends if you say uh, disseminate an app from a healthcare or uh, perspective then i think you should opt for the highest uh, quality and include a randomized controlled trial but uh, before you conduct your trial you could do loads of feasibility studies how you say to filter out what are the most important components what are what, what do people uh, 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 like because that's very important as well and I yeah I don't want to be rude but I think if we provide it as a mental health tool from a mental health care provider or another health professional provider or even from a public health perspective you should strive for the highest evidence base and the whole field is struggling with that currently and we're looking for new methods like uh, machine learning techniques on big data and all those things but so I think we sh we should still strive to obtain the best evidence uh, we have and do no harm I think that should do no harm. <laughs> all right well, well we're, we're gonna have to leave it at that I'd like to thank yeah. our, our participants today uh, uh, um, Helene Riper from uh, the Netherlands uh, Bethan Davies Jen Martin and uh, Mike Craven Mike next time we'll have a better connection for you I promise yeah. and you'll like, be able to yeah, yeah. More, uh, probably, I'll, I'll, I'll get on my right. Simon, Simon Lee uh, who presented a terrific paper, and Lisa Marzano in the background, um, uh, the, uh, the special edition editor for this edition of Evidence-Based uh, Mental Health. And I hope you join us for our next Hangout on the December 6th. To look for our, uh, look for our, uh, our, our tweets about this. Uh, we're looking forward to having another terrific discussion. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining us this, this afternoon, this morning. Morning for Thank you so much. Okay.